And so it is my pleasure <laughs> at this time to thank the library for sponsoring this Tuesday uh, talk here at the library. Uh, I will mention in the back, the library has uh, scoured their collection and found books for all ages. They have found uh, videos that relate directly to Mary Shelley that you are invited to check out. You can check out not only by looking them over, checking them out, but you can also with your little green card, actually check them out of the library to find out more about tonight's subject, Mary Shelley and her most famous creation, Frankenstein. By the way, is Frankenstein the monster or the creator? Oh, you guys are good. What was the monster's name? Yes, it did. It was Adam. Adam. The first man-made man. Adam. Oh, he was so clever. He was so original. All right, so uh, I hope I didn't give anything away. Okay, so... Um, so the library has relevant materials back there. Um, also, uh, we have a mailing list. Some of you may have signed up for the mailing list when you came in. We do not share this mailing list with outside firms with commercial interests, whatever. It's just to be able to send you things like our programs, like uh, news of upcoming events, like online things that we often also produce and, and have available that you can view in your own home. And we'll send you out information about that if you get on our mailing list. Plus, every summer, what makes your talk will work are our volunteers. We can always use volunteers for things like handing out brochures, pointing people to chairs, uh, things like that. We can always use your help. And if anybody is so moved to be a volunteer with the organization, we encourage you to do that. Besides, it's fun. It gives you a different perspective on how Chautauqua programs are done. Um, and then, uh, like I said, this magazine that I've covered part of is available over at the table with a list of all the shows we have done in the past for the last 25 years. This is our 25th season of the Greenville Chautauqua. All right. That being said, now we're ready. Uh, that being said, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce you tonight to Dr. Melissa Edmondson McCullough. She is a senior lecturer of English at Clemson University. She specializes in 19th and early 20th century British women writers with a particular interest in women's supernatural fiction. And I do believe we could classify bringing corpses back to life as fitting into the supernatural. Uh, she is also the author of women's ghost literature in 19th century Britain and of women's colonial Gothic writing from 1850 to 1930, The Haunted Empire. So with those credits to her name and with a presentation tonight for you on Mary Shelley, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce once again, Dr. Melissa Edmondson McCullough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much to uh, Greenville Chautauqua. Got a little bit of an echo here. Um, for inviting me to participate. Um, I'm really happy to see Mary Shelley on the list of personalities for this year. Um, she lived just 53 years, but she managed to pack a lot into that life. Um, there's a lot of tragedy um, and there's lots of kind of ups and downs. So we're in for a little bit of a, a bumpy ride. Uh, but before I talk about Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, I'd like to explore the early years of this remarkable author before she became Mary Shelley. She was born Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin on August 30th, 1797 in London and was the only daughter of William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft. So both of Mary's parents were literary celebrities in their own right. Mary Wollstonecraft was an early advocate of women's education and is best known for her pioneering feminist work, Vindication of the Rights of Woman, which she published in 1792. William Godwin was also a well-known social philosopher and novelist 
best known for his theories on moral philosophy and anarchism, which he described in An Inquiry Concerning Political Justice, which was published in 1793. Unfortunately, and this is sort of the very first early tragedy in what would be Mary Shelley's life, unfortunately, the birth of Mary Godwin in August of 1797 was also linked to a tragedy that would influence the remainder of her life and work. Mary Wollstonecraft's labor was not difficult, but complications developed shortly thereafter. She became increasingly ill and had uh, what is now described as an infection um, due to uh, placenta not being completely removed from the womb. And she got ill very quickly and died about 11 days after her daughter's birth. Four years after Wollstonecraft's death, Mary, William Godwin married Mary Jane Claremont, who brought two further children, it's getting a little bit crowded in the house, two further children, Charles and Claire Claremont, into the household that also included the young Mary and her half-sister, Fanny Imlay, went by Fanny Godwin. She was the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft and the American Army officer and diplomat, Gilbert Imlay. Uh, she was adopted by Godwin and was raised as his own child. Um, so she was, she went by Fanny uh, Godwin. Um, and then I have a few pictures here uh, for us. So um, we have to kind of keep up because I'll be adding a lot of people <laughs> uh, very shortly. So to the left, that is a picture of Fanny. And then to the right, we have a picture of Claire Claremont, um, who became Mary's, um, both actually are Mary's half-sisters. So a fifth sibling was added in 1803 with the birth of William Godwin Jr. The Godwin's family income during this time derived mainly from the proceeds of the juvenile library. This was Godwin and Mary Jane Claremont's joint publishing venture specializing in instruction books for young readers. And this is actually something that Mary Jane Claremont was known for uh, before she married uh, William Godwin. Okay, so moving on, um, another picture we have here of Mary Godwin. So the five children were instructed primarily at home. Following Godwin's progressive beliefs, there was little distinction made between the educations of girls and boys. So Mary Godwin had an education of considerable breadth, one that few girls really had at the time. She had a governess and a tutor and read many of her father's children's books on Roman and Greek history in their original languages. In 1811, Mary also attended a boarding school in Ramsgate in Kent. At the age of 10, she had her first experience with publication when the juvenile library printed one of her poems. So it's kind of nice to know the editor, right? Godwin described his daughter at age 15 as, quote, singularly bold, somewhat imperious, and active of mind. Her knowledge is great, and her perseverance in everything she undertakes almost invincible. Apart from this formal instruction, the children were exposed almost daily to Godwin's extensive acquaintances amongst the London intelligentsia, ranging from the poet and philosopher Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who Mary Herb recite his poem, The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, in Godwin's living room, to scientists like Humphrey Davy and her father's close friend, William Nicholson, the two foremost experimenters with galvanic electricity in the early years of the 19th century. This interest in what would become galvanism influenced Mary's depiction of Victor Frankenstein's creature as well. Okay, so in 1812, Mary first met Percy Bysshe Shelley, who would eventually become one of the most well-known radical poets of the era. Shelley was a frequent visitor to the Godwin home and was a great admirer of Godwin. He was from an aristocratic family, but quickly developed a reputation as a bit of a free spirit. He had been expelled from Oxford in 1811 after mailing copies of his poem, The Necessity of Atheism, to all the bishops and the heads of colleges in Oxford. 
Um, there is also an, um, one event where he blew up a tree, but I don't have time to get into all of that. Um, he was an advocate of free love, republicanism, and vegetarianism. He was also married at the time, but pursued Mary anyway, against the wishes of William Godwin. They would meet secretly at Mary Wollstonecraft's grave at St. Pancras Churchyard in central London, and it was here that they first professed their love for one another. Um, many people believe that they did more than just profess their love at the grave of Wollstonecraft, but I've been told to keep this talk PG, so use your imaginations. <laughs> In 1814, Mary and Percy eloped to the continent, accompanied by Mary's half-sister, Claire, Claremont, which you remember on the earlier slide. Um, Claire, who is someone I'll be mentioning quite a bit this evening, tended to compete with Mary. Um, in this case, she didn't want to be outdone by her half-sister and her relationship with Percy, so Claire decided to pursue her own poet bad boy. Claire was soon embroiled in her own scandal when she became pregnant with the child of another literary celebrity of the time, Lord Byron, a person described by Caroline Lamb as mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Um, and yes, Lamb also had a relationship with Byron. Um, to be honest, there weren't many people who did not have a relationship with Byron. Um, women, men, no one was safe. Um, true to his personality, Byron was himself dealing with other scandals besides his relationship with Claire Claremont. Around 1816, he was undergoing separation proceedings from his wife. When news broke of his relationship with his half-sister, Augusta, Byron left England. It was getting a little bit too hot. He left England for Europe and traveled over the next few years, residing in various places in Italy. Uh, Lord Byron also plays a major role in the creation of Frankenstein, so we'll return to him in a bit. During this time, Mary was experiencing a period of profound loss and grief. Her first child was a little girl who was born prematurely and died in February 1815. In her personal journal, which she would add to for the next 30 years, Mary recounts a recurring dream in which she was able to resuscitate her baby. She says, quote, dreamt that my little baby came to life again, that it had only been cold and that we rubbed it by the fire and it lived. I awake and find no baby. Mary's second child, which you see here, William, named after Mary's father, William Godwin, was born in January 1816 and was a few months old when Mary, Percy, and Claire Claremont traveled to Geneva where Mary began writing Frankenstein. Just three years later, however, William died of malaria. Her third child, Clara, was born in September 1817 and died about a year later. So again, you imagine, you know, Mary Shelley, not yet even 20 years old, um, you know, unmarried on the continent, and then, you know, suffering all this tremendous grief. Okay, so as if we don't have enough drama yet, I want to now talk about a massive volcanic eruption that, believe it or not, had a major impact on the creation of Frankenstein. The eruption of Mount Tamboro in Indonesia in April 1815 sent clouds of volcanic ash soaring into the upper atmosphere. In the following days, weeks, and months, the sun was obscured, temperatures dropped, and rainfall increased. The summer of the following year was dismal and damp and actually became known as the, summer with, uh, the year without a summer. It had low temperatures and torrential rain, causing disastrous crop failures throughout not only Asia, but also Europe and North America. People had to light candles in the middle of the day and birds started roosting at noon. Some even thought that these strange disturbances in the weather were caused by supernatural forces. So what does this have to do with Mary Shelley and the creation of Frankenstein? Well, during this time, Mary and Percy are invited by Lord Byron to join him at the Villa Diodati, which was located in and around Lake Geneva in Switzerland. 
The group spent their time riding, taking their boat out on the lake, reading ghost stories, and talking late into the night. But the weather remained bad, as Mary later wrote that it, quote, proved a wet, uncongenial summer, and incessant rain often confined us for days to the house. One evening, Lord Byron suggested that the group try writing ghost stories in order to pass the time. So the group ventures off into their different directions to work on their stories. Ironically, the two great poets, Percy Shelley and Lord Byron, have trouble coming up with any good ideas. Or, as Mary Shelley herself puts it, quote, the illustrious poets, annoyed by the platitude of prose, speedily relinquish their uncongenial task. So if you're ever having trouble writing anything, just tell people you're annoyed by the platitude of prose and they'll hopefully leave you alone. So on the other hand, we have two of the other members of the group also working on their stories. And these two stories will be some of the most famous in all of literature. So we have Byron's personal physician, John William Polidori, and he begins writing what would become one of the first vampire stories in the British language, The Vampire, which was published in 1819. Uh, he would also, or this work would also go on to influence Bram Stoker's 1897 um, most famous vampire novel, Dracula. Um, Polidori also, there's sort of a recurring theme of early death. Um, Polidori does not live much longer either. He dies at age 25. So there's another sort of tragic death and there will be more. Uh, Mary Shelley also takes the contest seriously and begins writing her own story that would eventually be expanded into Frankenstein. In her introduction to the 1831 edition of Frankenstein, and I'll talk about the different editions in a minute, she described her initial inspiration as a, quote, waking dream, which gave her the following vision. I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out, and then, on the working of some powerful engine, saw signs of life and stir with an uneasy half vital motion. Frightful must it be, or supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. And here we have the original manuscript of Frankenstein, which has luckily been preserved. This is the beginning of chapter four, where Victor Frankenstein brings the creature to life. And it is a little bit hard to read, um, especially from a little bit of a distance, but I'll be reading here from the first paragraph. It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning the rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. Upon her return to England in September of 1816, Mary began to develop the novel she had started in the summer, but its progress was slowed by more personal tragedies. And again, that's sort of a running theme in Mary Shelley's life. The first was the suicide of her half-sister Fanny in October. Then in December, the pregnant Harriet Shelley committed suicide by drowning. Two weeks after they were notified of Harriet's death, on December 30th, 1816, Mary Godwin and Percy Shelley were married. In January 1818, and actually the first day of the year, January 1st, 1818, Frankenstein was published in three volumes in an edition of just 500 copies. It was issued anonymously, so if you can make out, you don't see Mary Shelley's name anywhere on the title page. It has a preface written by Percy, and it is dedicated to William Godwin. 
It was an immediate success and really unlike anything anyone had ever read before. The story of the young scientist Victor Frankenstein, who creates life out of pieces of dead bodies and then abandons his creation, is really only the beginning of the story. The second volume, the literal heart of the novel, is the creature's story. He eloquently tells his reluctant creator how misery and loneliness have made him a monster and how he must live with the curse of being rejected by everyone around him, including his creator. Shelley included an epigraph from John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost, from 1667. It says, Did I request thee, maker, from my clay, to mold me, man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? These words perfectly encapsulate the central ideas of the novel. Creation, humanity, isolation, loneliness, responsibility, love, devotion, and what it means to be human. The second edition of Frankenstein was published in 1822 in two volumes. Following the success of the play, Presumption or the Fate of Frank Frankenstein, which was written by Richard Brinsley Peak. The second edition finally credited Mary Shelley as the book's author on the title page. In October 1831, the first one volume popular edition appeared. And this is what we see here. This new edition was heavily revised by Mary Shelley and includes a new introduction that explained her inspiration behind the story. And before I talk a little bit more about the introduction, I have to do a close up of actually the, the frontispiece here um, because some people have speculated that the face of the creature that's on the floor and Victor Frankenstein's to the right running out of the room, um, some people have speculated that the engraver actually modeled the face on Mary Shelley herself. So you might see some, maybe possibly some, some similarities there. Um, but this introduction is um, very helpful. We don't have that in the 1818 edition. It provides fascinating parallels between the author and her character, Victor Frankenstein, as Shelley describes her anxiety over the book's initial publication. And now, once again, I bid my hideous progeny go forth and prosper. I have an affection for it, for it was the offspring of happy days when death and grief were but words, which found no true echo in my heart. Its several pages speak of many a walk, many a drive, and many a conversation when I was not alone, and my companion was one who, in this world, I shall never see more. The, su the success and happiness that followed the publication of Frankenstein was short-lived, as Shelley alludes in this passage to losing Percy. Just a few days, or just a few years later, in July 1822, Percy Shelley died at the age of 29 when his boat went down in a sudden storm off the coast of Italy. Mary and Percy were staying in a rented house, and they had been here for about three months and arrived around April or so, 1822. Once again, taking with them Claire Claremont and their friends Edward and Jane Williams. Mary hated the place from the beginning and had a foreboding feeling that something bad was going to happen almost immediately when they arrived. This wasn't helped by the news that Allegra, Claire's daughter by Lord Byron, had died suddenly of a fever in the Italian convent where Byron had placed her. And I really should say abandoned her because that's pretty much what he did. Um, he also forbid Claire from ever seeing her again. Um, in June, Mary suffered a miscarriage. There was no doctor nearby, and she was so close to death that Shelley forced her to sit for seven hours in a bath of ice to stop the bleeding. Percy Shelley started having disturbing visions during this time as well. He was out one night on the terrace with Williams when he suddenly pointed out to the sea, saying, there it is again. 
He claimed he could see a child coming out of the water and looking at him. Percy was later found in Mary's room one night saying that he had seen the apparition of Edward Williams covered in blood and the sea flooding into the house. A few days earlier, he had seen the same man coming towards him on the terrace and asking him, how much longer do you mean to be content? On July 1st, Shelley took his boat down to the coast with Edward Williams aboard. It was 10 days before the bodies were found. The bodies were burned on the beach in the presence of Lord Byron and a few of Shelley's friends, a scene depicted in this painting here titled The Funeral of Shelley. And this is um, by Edouard Fournier. It was done in 1889, and it currently hangs in the Walter Art Gallery in Liverpool, England. Shelley's heart did not burn during the cremation, and Mary kept it wrapped in silk for the rest of her life. It was finally buried with their son, Percy Florence, upon his death in 1889. And I'll talk a little bit about Percy Florence. Okay, so take a breath. Okay, so Mary Shelley at this time found herself without sufficient financial means to remain in Italy. So she returned to England in the fall of 1823. She never equaled the popular success of Frankenstein, but she published a number of other novels. Valpersia, published in 1823, is a novel about Castruccio Castracani, a 14th century historical figure who conquered Florence. In the novel, Castracani's armies threaten the fictional fortress of Valpersia, which is governed by Countess Euthanasia, unfortunate name, I don't know, <laughs> the woman he loves. Uh, he forces her to choose between himself and her political freedom. And I'll leave that as a cliffhanger in case you'd like to read that. The Last Man, published in 1826, is notable for being one of the first, if not the first, post-apocalyptic novel. It begins in the year 2073 and ends in the year 2100 and tells the story of Lionel Verney, who becomes the, quote, last man when he survives a pandemic that seemingly wipes out everyone else on Earth. The Fortunes of Perkin Warbeck, published in 1830, is a historical novel about Perkin Warbeck, who claimed that he was the second son of Edward IV and one of the princes in the tower. Lodor, published in 1835, is about the lives of the wife and daughter of the title character, Lord Lodor, who was killed in a duel early in the book. This is significant, Lodor is significant too, because it is one that really foregrounds, um, you know, really strong central female characters. Uh, Faulkner, the next one, published in 1837, also has a central female character named Elizabeth Raby. At six years old and an orphan, Elizabeth prevents Rupert Faulkner from committing suicide. He adopts her and educates her. However, she falls in love with Gerald Neville, whose mother Faulkner had killed years before. I'll also leave that as a little bit of a cliffhanger. In 1819, so I'm backing up a little bit, but I have a reason for this. In 1819, Mary wrote a short novel titled Matilda. She wrote this during a prolonged period of depression following the deaths of her children, Clara and William. And the plot centers on darker themes, probably not surprisingly. It is narrated by Matilda, a woman in her 20s, while she is on her deathbed. She writes her story for her friend, Woodville, a young poet. Part of the narrative describes Matilda's father's confession of his incestuous love for her. After Mary finished the manuscript, she sent it to her father to submit it for publication. Godwin, however, found that the incest theme was a little bit too scandalous and refused to return the manuscript despite repeated efforts by Mary Shelley to get him to return it. It wasn't published until 1959. Some scholars have suggested that the story, you might be thinking, is autobiographical, with Mary as Matilda, William Godwin as the unnamed father, and Percy Shelley as Woodville. 
Uh, but in recent years, this theory has been largely dismissed. Um, there's maybe other works that Mary Shelley was a little bit more influenced, um, as, um, even um, some works by her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, and I just wanted to show quickly as well, um, if you're interested in reading more by Mary Shelley, um, if you have read Frankenstein and maybe you're interested in, in exploring other works by her, um, there's a press uh, called Broadview Press, and they do really nice, affordable, really nice scholarly editions um, for general readers. And they have recently published several of Mary Shelley's novels. So luckily, they're coming back into print. Frankenstein has really never been out of print, but um, her other novels are now a lot more accessible, which is, which is nice. So in addition to her novels, Mary produced short stories, biographies, and travel writings. Throughout the 1820s and 1830s, she contributed over 20 short stories to literary annuals such as The Keepsake. Many of these stories share similar themes to one she explored in Frankenstein. For instance, Roger Dodsworth, the reanimated Englishman, published in 1826, depicts a man frozen in ice and how he is revived in the present day. And this incorporates what would become a popular science fiction theme of chronics. Likewise, The Mortal Immortal, published in 1833, describes the cursed life of Winsy, I love that name, a young man who has lived for 323 years. Between 1832 and 1839, Mary Shelley wrote many biographies of notable French, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese men and women for Dionysus Lardner's Lives of the Most Eminent Literary and Scientific Men. These form part of Lardner's popular cabinet, Cyclopedia. So I think really, you know, Mary Shelley, rightfully so, has earned her reputation as the author of Frankenstein. But, you know, some people sort of maybe assume that that was all she ever wrote, and she definitely didn't. So in addition to writing, you know, several other novels, um, she was a very gifted writer of biography as well, travel writings and such, short stories. Okay, so Mary was also influential in preserving the reputation of Percy Shelley, and really she solidified his reputation as one of the leading Romantic era poets. Um, I think it's fair to say that we, or maybe to speculate that we might not be reading um, Percy Shelley's poetry if it wasn't for Mary Shelley. Uh, Mary Shelley edited the posthumous poems of Percy Shelley in 1824, and the poetical works of Percy Shelley in 1839. In the years after their deaths, the relationship between Mary and Percy took on almost mythical proportions, as seen here in the memorial to the couple in Christchurch Priory, Dorset. This was created by Henry Weeks in 1853. Um, I just had to show this because I think it's so dramatic. Um, it's supposed to be kind of a dramatized presentation of Mary cradling the body of Percy Shelley when, after he was drowned. Um, none of that actually happened. Um, okay, so moving on to Percy Florence. The Shelley's only surviving child, Percy Florence Shelley, was born in 1819 and remained devoted to his mother. Of course, he never really knew his father. According to Percy Shelley's wishes, their son was educated at private school at Harrow with his paternal grandfather's financial help. And I should add, it was very reluctant financial help. Um, Sir Timothy um, was not a big fan of Mary Shelley, um, and he very begrudgingly uh, supported Percy Florence. So there was a little bit of a um, difficult relationship there. Uh, but Percy Florence eventually attends Trinity College, Cambridge, and finally inherits the baronetcy after the death of Shelley's father, Sir Timothy, in 1844. And it was really at 1844 where he inherits that fortune. And this is really the first time in Mary Shelley's life when she's really kind of financially secure and can be comfortable and not have to worry all the time about, you know, making money. So Mary Shelley died in her home in Chester Square, London, on February 1st, 1851. According to her daughter-in-law, Jane Shelley, 
Mary had asked to be buried with her parents in the graveyard at St. Pancras, but was buried instead at St. Peter's Church, Bournemouth, near Jane and Percy Florence's home at Boscombe. Um, Jane and Percy Florence said that they found St. Pancras awful and horrible looking, so they decided to bury Mary Shelley near them, and then they moved William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft. So it's kind of hard to see again, but they're all sort of, you know, finally buried together. Um, Percy Shelley, I should say, is buried in Rome. On the first anniversary of Mary Shelley's death, the Shelleys opened her box desk. And this is a picture um, of Mary Shelley's dressing box. And this is still in a private collection um, still owned, I think, by the family, but definitely in a private collection. Uh, and we can see kind of little mementos that she had. Um, do I have my little, ah, my little clicker. Um, if you can see here, like there's two little kind of cream-colored, uh, looks like sheets of paper. So she would, um, she had saved some of her children's locks of hair, um, some locks of hair from Percy and actually Lord Byron as well. Um, again, it's a little bit hard to see. There's some um, mourning jewelry, which is actually made out of the hair of Mary Shelley. Um, we have an amethyst ring that was owned by Mary Wollstonecraft that Mary Shelley really treasured. Um, so that's kind of nice to be able to see. Also, there's like a little folding. I know it's kind of hard to see, but a little folding fork and knife set, and that belonged to Mary Wollstonecraft as well. So inside... Um, the, the Shelleys, Percy Florence, and Jane find these items, and they also, in this box, and it's not shown here, but they also find um, the remains of, remember, Percy Shelley's heart. They find the remains of the heart, um, and that is, again, finally buried uh, with Percy Florence when he dies in 1889. So it's safe to say that Mary Shelley was a survivor, and so, too, was her first novel. In the years following Mary Shelley's death, Frankenstein took on a life of its own. It has been translated into more than 30 languages and has gone through more than 300 different editions. It was the subject of one of the earliest films done by Thomas Edison, actually, in 1910, and eventually became a success for producer Carl Lemley and Universal Studios with the 1931 Frankenstein, directed by James Whale, a film which helped to define, for better or for worse, the film genre and also how we see Shelley's quote-unquote monster. The creature was played by Boris Karloff and gave us this iconic image that lasts to this day, right? When we think about even Frankenstein, right, who's the scientist, but when we hear Frankenstein, you know, I think a lot of us, I know I do, we see this image, right? This is the creature. The film also was instrumental in helping to establish what we think of when we imagine the quote-unquote mad scientist, here played by Colin Clive. The film's sequel in 1935, The Bride of Frankenstein, also gave us this iconic image of the bride played by Elsa Lanchester. But none of this would have been possible without the woman who, at just 18 years old, accepted the challenge to write a ghost story. Thank you. If you have a question for her, then uh, simply raise your hand. We'll come over and you get a chance to ask your question and we'll find out more. I think our first question right over here. I'm wondering about how the public perception of Frankenstein was when it was first published. I mean, was it just a good story and they liked it for that reason or did they read more into it? Uh, like, could this really happen or what are we getting into? Yeah, that's a good question. It was extremely popular. I mean, right away, it went into, you know, a second edition just a few years later. It had the play, you know, based on it. So it was very popular, um, but it was a bit daring for the time as well. So people were quite surprised and shocked by the subject matter, you know, of someone, you know, taking, 
you know, parts, rob, I mean, he's robbing graves as well um, to get these parts. And, you know, Victor's isolating himself from his family to create this thing and is really obsessed with creating this thing more for his ambition, his personal ambition. So I think that that was not lost. I think the public really, you know, took that in. But this daring idea that you don't need to have a woman to create anything, that there's, you know, some way of creating that goes beyond a woman that goes beyond God, right, in that sense at that time. Um, so, you know, people tend to debate, again, it was published anonymously. Mary Shelley's name wasn't on the title page. Um, so some people say, well, you know, it was because she was a woman. And there might be a small piece of that, but I think mainly it was just the subject matter that it was so daring that people were quite shocked by it. Uh, but when it was reviewed in, you know, journals and things like that of the time, it was largely reviewed very well, very positively. So, so I think people, you know, were, were quite surprised. And that was maybe part of the appeal as well, that, like I said, nothing like it had really ever been written before. And another question, I think, do you have one over there? No, I have one right here in front. Uh, given the level of dysfunction and tragedy and sorrow that seems to pervade the lives of these people, mm -hmm. I wonder how big a role, if any, did drugs like opium, for example, play in their lives? Yeah, I don't know. Um, really, to, there's, you know, not much written about how much, but they did have people in their circles <laughs> um, who were known to take drugs. Percy Shelley, you know, experimented with a few things. Um, so maybe some of it, you know, drugs and alcohol. <laughs> but, you know, it was it was just kind of part of the, the romantic movement, too, as well. Just kind of this time of just, you know, experiment, kind of expanding that out, just time of experimentation and, and being daring. And um, I, I had an um, instructor in grad school say that the romantic period, which is sort of the beginning decades of the 19th century, had more in common with the 1960s than the 1860s. So it kind of goes along to that, you know, yeah. Hey, and other questions? Sure. Uh, she was struggling financially a lot of her life, I gather, from what you said. Yes. How did she, it takes a lot of time and expense to research biographies, but she wrote all of these biographies. How did she afford to do that? She amassed a pretty nice library. So um, some of it came from Percy Shelley as well. Um, he had he had a little bit of money, but he was sort of kept out of Sir Timothy, his father and grandfather's, all the money that came with that. They kind of cut him off because they knew. Um, so he kind of amassed a pretty nice sized library, and he, he and Mary kind of shared that. Um, so she was able, thankfully, to do, you know, a lot of the research. And when she was young, just a little girl, she was able to kind of reap the benefits of William Godwin's library. And there are accounts where he would find her, you know, in there, five or six years old, you know, reading his books out of his, li not just the juvenile library ones, but um, very early on she could read, you know, Greek and Latin and um, and she really she really used it to great effect later on. So I think again, like I said, that's one thing that um, maybe she's not as much well known for, you know, that she did. She was a very gifted writer of biography. So yeah, on the front on the left. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so did I hear you correctly that you said that Percy Shelley's first wife committed suicide while she was pregnant? Yes, um, it probably, it was not Percy Shelley's child. Um, <laughs> I don't have time to go into all the details. I had to kind of, you know, edit, but um, yes, yeah, so she um, was found drowned in the Serpentine, which is a lake in Hyde Park, London. Um, and she had, she had asked Percy for help and support and he had, you know, abandoned her um, to go to Europe, you know, with Mary Shelley, so Mary Godwin. Um, so she had asked, she had written letters saying that she needed, you know, 
She was not well off. She needed financial help. And she was going through a period of depression. And most people believe that that's, that's what caused that, that she was just, she just didn't see any other way. Um, and it was sort of, I, I chose to cut this out as well, but um, there's been some speculation again about Fanny, the half-sister who also committed suicide. Um, some people early on speculated that she sort of discovered that William Godwin wasn't her father. Um, but this has sort of been ruled out because she actually had access to Mary Wollstonecraft's writings. And Wollstonecraft was very progressive and very open about that relationship. Um, pretty much the only reason that Wollstonecraft and Godwin married was because she was about five months pregnant with Mary Shelley. And I think they wanted to maybe give her some legitimacy. Um, so they had been together for a while. So it wasn't that. So some people claim that Mary Wollstonecraft suffered from depression as well. And um, people are now sort of speculating that Fanny felt, again, very isolated. She was very close to Mary. Mary leaves. Um, they didn't have a good relationship with Mary Jane Claremont. Um, both of the girls, Mary and Fanny, did not have a good relationship with Mary Jane. And Fanny was sort of left in that household. And again, kind of just the mental pressures, people say now that, that she also was depressed. But not to go on, but it, it leads into some interesting speculation again about all of this is happening around the time that Mary Shelley is writing Frankenstein. And, you know, that idea of abandonment and guilt really works its way into the novel because Mary felt guilt for the rest of her life for not being there for her half-sister, but also, you know, deep down feeling that she was part of the cause for Harriet's suicide as well. So, yeah. But I think we can, we should blame Percy more for that. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, he left her, yeah, left, just kind of left her there, yeah. I understand there were three parts to the Frankenstein novel. Originally, yes. How did the first part end? So the first part ends with, um, in chapter four, if you remember the, the manuscript, that's really where the creation scene occurs. And immediately after that, Victor Frankenstein just literally runs out of the room and abandons the creature. And you see Victor, there's a lot of kind of walking over mountains and roaming around. And that's sort of where it ends. Um, we have a trial that happens because um, William Frankenstein, who is Victor's youngest little brother, is killed. And that is blamed, <laughs> giving some away here, it's blamed on the family servant, Justine. And Victor knows that the creature has killed William, but he stays silent. And he lets Justine be hanged for the crime. And that's where volume one ends. And then volume two pretty much immediately picks up. Like I said, it is the heart of the novel because that's where we get the, the first meeting, the second meeting, however you want to think about it. That's where we get the meeting of Victor and the creature. And, you know, one thing that, again, you know, in the Karloff version that we see, um, from 1931, there are no words, right? There's just, there's sounds and there's gestures. And, you know, Karloff does an excellent job at, you know, translating emotion, but there are no words. And, you know, for years and years and years, we have really lost the original intentions of Mary Shelley. Um, because if you pick up Frankenstein, um, you'll be shocked at how eloquent the creature really is. Um, he's much more eloquent than Victor, He's more, much more reasoned. Uh, Victor just wants to yell and scream and attack. And the creature you know, says, no, please listen to me. You know, here's what you owe me. Um, this is what has turned me into a monster. So, and then in the third volume, um, the creature asks for a mate, asks Victor to create um, a companion for him that looks the way he does so he'll be accepted. Um, maybe I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and then again, um, yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't end well, but um, it's a, it's a great story. So yeah. 
Yeah, but right. volume two is all the creature's story. So Percy Shelley was only 30 years old when he died. 29. Mm -hmm. 29, wow. So he wasn't, she did uh, publicize his life. Really, I mean, he, he was starting to finally, you know, kind of get a reputation. Lord Byron had the reputation. For all I've said about him, he was a very successful poet. Um, so he was kind of moving in that circle. He was sort of beginning to become kind of well-known, but I don't think, you know, that we would be reading him, you know, today, you know, in, in English classes if we didn't have those editions, you know, those collected works, because she really spent a lot of time pulling all those poems together. When you think about it, no one else really could have done it, right? Because she had his manuscripts and things like that and um, just sort of made it her life's work to, to really forward that reputation and make sure that no one forgot about him. Hey, I know we have any more questions. Yes, right over here. Why do your students think that Frankenstein is relevant today? What do they think about it? They they still love the novel. I'm teaching it this semester. I teach it almost <laughs> almost every semester, not quite every semester, but they just they are surprised by the fact, one, that Victor is so young because I tell them, Victor's your age, right? You know, I have my, my classes of, you know, 18, early 20-year-olds, and that's one of the first things I say is, you know, Victor's your age. He's in college, and, you know, he's not answering his family's letters, and he's going off to create this thing. And um, so they're, they're surprised by that. Um, but they also, you know, they... They just get that creature's story. And the big discussion that we have is my rule is you can't call him a monster unless you have a very good reason behind it. You have to defend your answer um, because I call him a creature. And we have great discussions about how he's born, right? You know, is he born good? Is he born bad? Or is he born neutral? right? You know, that idea of a blank slate and experience makes him the way he is. He's treated poorly and he becomes what he says is a fiend, you know, what he becomes miserable. Um, so we have great debates about that. And then I ask them by the end, you know, we know everything we know about him. And <laughs> we said at the beginning, right, you know, who is Frankenstein? And we all said it's the scientist, right? Um, uh, for a few, I heard both. And for me, it is both. Um, and I feel that Victor's more of a monster than the creature. So we have great discussions about that. And then we, you know, more than we can do tonight, but we talk about, you know, does he have a soul? You know, does he even need a soul? Um, so we have, we have great discussions about that as well. Um, but they absolutely love, usually they will you know, get to the end of the semester and they say that's their, that's their favorite, it's their favorite novel. So, <laughs> 1818, you know, just not too long ago celebrated its 200th, you know, anniversary and um, still relevant. You know. We have a question from the live stream over here. Okay. <laughs> um, can you comment on Victor's lack of remorse for sending Justine to the gallows when he knew she was innocent? It's all about Victor. <laughs> um, so he ends volume one, um, sitting, you know, in the courtroom, watching Justine go to her death for a crime that she didn't commit, saying how miserable he is. <laughs> so it's, and it tends to be all about Victor throughout the novel. Um, and again, towards the end, we kind of have to ask ourselves the question, um, if you have read it, you know, if you read it, is there any personal growth there? Is there any sense of responsibility of taking responsibility for not considering consequences, right? You know, it'd be great to create this thing, but, um, so there's that central question, just because we can do something, should we do something, right? 
Um, so, so that's unfortunately, I feel like a big character flaw for Victor. Um, there's really, <laughs> there's no remorse. It's all about how bad Victor feels for himself. And a question over here to your right. Could you comment about Young Frankenstein, the movie, or Frankenstein, as far as following her story? Yes. Um, I was saying before the program, my, my dissertation director, um, who's actually an expert on Mary Shelley and edited her journals, um, always claimed that was the most faithful adaptation of, <laughs> so I'm going to take her word for it. Um, I, you know, it's not my favorite adaptation, um, but I feel like the scene where he presents him, right, and he's on the stage, right, and he's doing the tap dance number, um, that does get towards some of what Victor kind of hopes to do. You know, if all things go well, he's going to present this thing, you know, to his colleagues and his professors and his family, and everyone, again, is going to say, Look what Victor has done. So I feel like there are scenes in that film, even though, you know, it's meant to be a comedy, that it does kind of get towards the spirit. So um, so anyway, maybe. <laughs> maybe faithful. Um, I still, I like the 1931. Um, I, I feel like, you know, that's a classic for a reason, but it does take a lot of license. With In that film, Victor comes off much more sympathetic, but it's also the lack of speech that we don't have the creature saying anything. Um, and that's such a central part of our sympathy for the creature is, is that speech. Um, I will say, if anyone has seen the, um, the program Penny Dreadful that came on a few years ago, was on cable, um, if you'll recall the, the, the presentation of the creature, um, he actually reads romantic poetry and um, Rory Kinnear, the actor who portrays him, that is actually one of my favorite adaptations of the creature. And I think it really gets towards more of the original intention that Mary Shelley had. So a little bit beyond your question, but yeah. And, and, and my own favorite thing from that novel is that, of course, now it's written by an 18 and 19-year-old girl who is not a trained physiologist, right? So she makes the monster extra large so that it will be easier to sew the pieces together by being extra big. And, and you think about it, it seems that in real life, knowing what we know about neurosurgery, that making the creature bigger would not make it easier to connect the pieces. It just gives you more pieces to connect. Well, that's interesting, too, because Victor, he works for two years or so, you know, putting together. He's very careful about putting the creature together and that this is another thing, again, I cannot take credit for. Um, my, my dissertation director, Paula Feldman, taught it in this way. And we looked at that, you know, scene in chapter four, and that's the creation scene. And something I'll never forget, she says, you know, what is it that makes Victor run out of the room? He's looked at this thing for two years. He knows what it looks like, what has changed. And she says it's not how he looks, it's that he looks. And it's that weight of responsibility that comes on Victor that he can't handle. So. Fatherhood. Fatherhood. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, and we talk, again, we talk about that as well, my students. We talk about, you know, this is, this is an absentee, you know, parent. This is abandonment. And then, you know, you go back and all of the things, you know, that maybe Mary Shelley was dealing with in her own life, it kind of comes out as well in the novel. Other questions for us this evening? Once again, I would like to thank, oh, there's a question. Yes, there's a question over here. Yes, yes. My question is about the book Fortunes of Perkin Warbeck. Is there a backstory what 
made her want to write about the princes in the tower? I don't know. I'm, there, there might be, you know, something that she wrote about it inspiration-wise. I don't really know off the top of my head. Um, she was very, again, with the biography, she was very interested in history. I mean, extremely well-read. Um, she takes a Yorkist side <laughs> and, and, is, and really kind of dramatizes that whole, you know, he was an imposter, right? You know, but um, she takes the side of, you know, the Yorkist and it's, it's, it's really one of, I feel like her better, you know, kind of historical because a lot of those that I mentioned, they're just historical. There's not a lot of Gothic. There's, there's a lot of Gothic in her short stories. Like I mentioned, um, The Last Man can be seen in science fiction, um, but but I don't know maybe maybe something in her her journals I'd have to look and see um, but I feel like with with all I mean she was an an extremely intelligent woman um, so I feel like maybe some you know interest that she had maybe something that she had read that you know she wanted to explore that um, I'm not sure if I go back to I don't think um, I don't know if that's in a modern edition, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I'm not sure if that's one that's been republished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Down front, just to your left. Yeah. Question. Um, why do they think that Percy's heart didn't burn when they, when his body washed up? I mean, that's a really... It's so Percy, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course his heart's not going to burn. <laughs> the immortal Percy. Yeah, again, it's so much like fact and fiction and pulling, you know, different ways out. But they they had, at the time, because of health concerns, they had actually buried the two bodies. It looked nothing like the romanticized version. They had buried them. They had to dig them up, and then they burned them again for, for health reasons. They said that one of the friends, um, Edward Trelawney, who was there with Lee Hunt and um, Lord Byron, um, Trelawney rushed in and grabbed the heart and out of the ashes. And there was a fight for the heart, and everyone wanted the heart. And then I think Lee Hunt, one of the friends, wanted the heart and took it. And then Trelawney said, no, Mary should have it. So then she finally ended up with it. So, the, the heart so, but then they find, they find that in, in the dressing box, which wasn't pictured, but they find that, and they also find like a little packet of his ashes that she kept with her. So. The, the heart, by the way, this is reported in many burnings, burns and pit, witches on the, on the stakes and all that. It's like a freak thing, isn't it? It's, yeah. It's the, the, the cavity of the heart is surrounded by fluids. Yeah. The heart is a very dense muscle. It cooks more slowly than everything else. And it was just there. And so it survives. Yeah. And I think there's another online question for oh, you. Okay. <laughs> okay. The non-acceptance by the family the creature visit is heartbreaking. Do your students tend to comment on that? The Delacy's. Yeah. So um, in volume two, he's talking about... Um, his journey, the creature's journey, um, after being abandoned by Victor, and he comes across this family. And my students do, we really talk about that scene because, again, it shows how the creature is really at heart, you know, very good. And what he does is he's taking, you know, food and things from the family, and then he realizes that the family is not well off and they are struggling to, you know, make ends meet and, you know, have enough food for everyone. And when he realizes this, he stops taking the food and then starts actually helping the family. So he'll, he'll chop firewood at night and leave it for them. So that's one less chore that they have to do. And he'll eat like nuts and berries from the woods and forage to not take food from the DeLacy's. Um, so we kind of talk about, we have good discussions about if you're being good, you know, there's some little bit of selfishness in being good, right? Because, you know, I'm doing good. I want everyone around me to see me doing good, right? So you're doing good, but you're also kind of feeling good yourself, right? 
So we have that discussion of he's doing all of this. No one knows that he's there. He's doing it solely for the good of them, and he's also doing without, and he's going hungry. Um, and then, for lack of a better term, old man Delacy um, is blind, and he develops a relationship with the creature because he can't see the creature. And it's only when one of the family members comes in and sees the creature that he's driven out of that house as well. Um, so, yeah, so we do have some good conversations regarding the creature's Again, that altruism and that sense of, you know, again, how he learns and pretty much starts off as being good, and then he's made to be bad or evil as the novel goes on. Anyone else? I want to thank you very much for sharing with us this thank evening. You. Thank you for having me. Uh, we have one more library program early in May. I think it's maybe May the 9th. We will have a presentation about the life of Robert Ripley and his uh, uh, what has followed Robert Ripley as far as the Ripley Entertainment Incorporation that, that he started with his Believe It or Not cartoons. And then just a month after that, we have the summer festival starting. So uh, we're only now maybe seven weeks away from the Summer Festival. And, of course, everyone is invited to the Summer Festival. All the shows are free. Please come out. Please see shows. Please bring your friends. And uh, thank you very much for being here tonight. I'm sure you all enjoyed it. I know I learned a lot here, and I do appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you.